Good morning, Pine Grove. Good morning, Pine Grove. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a round of applause in the house. Good to be in God's house. Ma'am. Round of praise. Round of praise. Praise. Yeah. Anyway, good morning. Got several announcements. I hope you're glad to be here this morning. Uh, we get to rejoice. We get to color a brick this morning. Come on, Pine Grove. I want to welcome you this morning, our guests, and welcome those online as well. I've got several announcements I want to give you. One is I want to give a shout out to uh, Lamar and to Maddox and to Jacob. We now have live stream feed into the nursery downstairs so they can hear the sermon as well. I really appreciate that. I know Ms. Linda does and the ladies does. But uh, this morning, if you have a prayer request, please fill out your connection cards. Those are prayed over. Um, any information that you'd like to speak with a pastor, um, we have CR this evening at 5. Ms. Pam? Okay. Uh, small group tonight, Johnny and Tracy at 5 o'clock as well. Uh, our youth at 5 o'clock this evening. Um, remember the sock hop coming up the 24th. Get with uh, Donna Williamson about that. Uh, our mature folks, 50 and over, and so, I mean, if you're 49, 48, you make him squeak in there. Uh, but a great, great time there to be had sock hop the 24th. I also want to tell you that we start our Christmas practice this evening at 3 o'clock for our Christmas program. So I hope you'll be excited about that. I hope you'll come early, be in prayer about that. Going to be a lot of singing. And uh, we're, we're excited after COVID to be able to get back and, uh, and have a, uh, our Christmas program. Uh, am I forgetting anything, Brother Ricky? Is that pretty much everything? Are y'all ready to praise God? All right, stand up. Come on, praise team. so hard yesterday to get our microphones working and the nursery now can hear us. I don't know that the nursery wants to hear us, but yeah. Let's worship this morning. Say your love. 
goes on forever that your mercy never stops so why would i assume you'll be somebody that you're not like the sun in the morning i know you're gonna be there every day so what on earth could make me be afraid good god oh There is a 
God, I am so thankful that you never, ever will let us down. God, I thank you for that. Whatever he plays, that's what we're going to sing. I've never been more loved than I am right now. Wasn't holding you up, so there's nothing I can do to let you. It doesn't take a trophy to make you proud. I've never been more loved than I am right now. Going through a storm, but I won't go down. I hear your voice carried in the rhythm of the wind to call me out. You
do you say that I am? When I think of myself, I know exactly what you see. Every flaw, every blemish, the scars of my hurts and my mistakes, the things I've done to myself, the things that have been said and done to me, that's who I am. You see a mother, a daughter, a sister, an aunt, you see the scarce shadow of a woman's potential irreversibly wrapped in failure. But then I hear it. That still, small voice. Who told you that? Who told you that you are defined by your mistakes? Who told you that you are ugly and broken? Who told you that you are only measured by what you give others? Who told you that brokenness and frailty are what you carry? Haven't you heard? You are not what everyone says you are. You are who God says you are, and you are His. He says you are fearfully and wonderfully made. He says you are a perfect design, made for a purpose, made for a destiny, and you are never alone. He says he'll never leave you nor forsake you. He goes before you. He goes behind you. He says you are bold. He says you are brilliant. He says you are brave. He says greater is he that is in you. hand painted by the master himself. You are who God says you are. Ooh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. Church, God is awesome. Oh, God is good. And all the time. Amen. Give the Lord another hand clap of praise. Amen, amen. Johnny, come on up here and color that brick. The ushers were holding him down a while ago trying to tickle him and everything, and he didn't get up here, so amen. I'm telling you, church, uh, <laughs> um, welcome to each and every one. Glad you're here. Uh, welcome to all of our guests, our visitors. Welcome to those watching online. We love you. Praise God for you. Uh, I don't know if we've announced it yet uh, here in this setting. I know we have in other settings, but Miss Joan Pike is at home now, so praise God for that. Amen. And also, uh, Carl Smith, uh, I'm telling you, God, God's done a work in that man's, in his uh, heart, his literal heart, not just his, his soulish heart, but in his heart, because the doctors were saying heart transplant and all that kind of stuff, and now he's in a room. At East Alabama doing rehab and so he's he's doing good so praise God amen and, uh, so tell you what uh, I know uh, that uh, you know Sunday mornings you know most of the time we try to keep it at a, at a level to where you know uh, everybody can can so to speak uh, reach reach the cookies okay Today, uh, I'm going to put it as simple as I can. I don't know if I should be so excited about preaching out of the book of Leviticus. Uh, I'm telling you, this is something that during my uh, Bible reading, uh, as I went through the book of Leviticus, and again, uh, folks, listen, man, God's word, I, I can't tell you. I love God's Word. God's Word will transform you if you let it. And, and so I'm going to keep it as, as easy to comprehend as I can. I know several weeks ago I told you about God had revealed something new to me in, in the book of Leviticus. Now, Leviticus is in the Old Testament. Let's see, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Uh, third book of, of the Old Testament. Uh, we're going to get into that. Uh, but before I get into it, man, I, because I told you, you know, there's a, 
and, and me and Brother Jim, we've had fun with this. Uh, I, I was sharing with our Tuesday morning uh, Bible study class that there's things in the Bible that I just don't get. I, I just, I just don't get it. And, and this was one of them where in the book of Leviticus it talks about how that God uh, told Moses, he said, you know, you, you take and you anoint the right earlobe, the right thumb, and the right big toe. And I'm thinking, okay, <laughs> how can anything spiritual come from that? What, what was the point of it? And, and so that's something literally for years that I've wrestled with. And I'm like, okay, I, I, I just, I, and I know y'all don't do this. I'm just like, okay, I'm going to read over this real quick. I'm not going to try to, you know, get it in because I don't know what it means. So I'm kind of like the so-and-so begot, so-and-so begot, so-and-so. I know y'all just take your time and you read through that, right? No. It, it, we just kind of gloss over it real quick. But man, this year, as I was reading through his word, and I got to that section where he's talking about anointing the, the right earlobe and the right thumb and the right big toe, I'm like, oh my God, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And Man, you're talking about opening and blowing my mind. It was awesome. But before I go to the, to the right earlobe and the right thumb and the right big toe, we got to lay some foundation because I was thinking, God, they ain't, they ain't going to get this. Not, not, on, not in one, one little sermon, they ain't going to get this. And, and I mean, I went back and I, I, I'm one of those I know I'm a geek, I'm a weirdo, that's okay. I've been called a lot worse, okay? Uh, but <sighs> Jacob understands me because Jacob has this, this, this mind. We don't want to know, okay, you flip the switch and it works. We, that's cool, but we want to know why it works, how it works. We, we got to know details, and I know a lot of you are the same way. I'm not okay with just, okay, I got the cake. I want the recipe. I, I, got, I got on to Miss Beverly, and, and she kind of proved me wrong, but, but then again, uh, she had made some kind of a dip for chips here recently, and I said, did you write down, and, and I'm a freak about this, did you write down the recipe? Did you, is your measurements, the next time you make this, are your measurements, Gonna, is this going to taste the same? And she's like, no, I didn't write it down, but I know I can make it again. And, and years ago, I, I called her up. She wanted me to do something. I'm like, how much do you put in this? Well, I don't know. I just sprinkle some until it tastes good. And I'm like, oh, that drives me nuts. I got to know the recipe. I got to know the recipe. Because I, I, I love consistency. I, I love it. Man, when I, when I eat uh, biscuits, I want them to taste the same every time. When, when I eat uh, peas or cornbread or whatever, man, when, it, when it's excellent, I don't want to dip down below that. And, and, and so I'm telling you all that to help you to understand something, church. Man, God's word. You're talking about giving you some detail. We're going to read a, a scripture out of the New Testament before we go to Leviticus. And then I'm going to help try to help you to understand why Leviticus is so important and so relevant to our lives today. It, it just it blows my mind. I went back and, and, and the thing that God had spoken to me in the spirit when I was reading the book of Leviticus I actually went online, found some, uh, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer. Look, I don't know if, if y'all know this or care anything about it. Uh, Jews wrote the Bible primarily, especially the Old Testament. Complete Jewish people wrote the Bible. So guess what? When I want to know something about the Hebrew writings, I go to Jewish websites because who knows better than they do you know, about their language uh, that they've always had and their traditions and all this going on. 
And, and so I went back and found some uh, universities where rabbis go to school and, and they learn all this stuff. And I'm like, and, and as I got into it, I'm like, oh my Lord, exactly what they're teaching to Orthodox Jewish rabbis today is what God had spoken into my spirit. And I'm like, we serve a living and an awesome God. And, and, and Wednesday night, I, I mentioned to you about doctrines uh, in our first Wednesday service. Listen, one of the doctrines of the Bible is the doctrine of God's immutability. He does not change. He does not change. The same God that we're going to read about today that was interacting with, with Moses is the same God that you and I deal with. And, and he has the same purpose and plan for our lives as he did for Moses, Aaron, and Aaron's sons. Okay? So just keep all that in mind. Okay? Keep all that in mind. But before we get into the reading of God's word, let's just bow our heads because we're going to need God's Holy Spirit. Okay? Can you say amen? amen. This stuff is not discerned with natural intellect. It was the Spirit of God who inspired its writings, and it is the Spirit of God who reveals the truth of this word to us. Okay, so let's pray and ask God to help us. Gracious Heavenly Father, sir, we do humble ourselves. And Father, I thank you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this message that you have given us this day and lord oh what what a deep message message it is but but lord also what a necessary message it is lord in order for us to regain and retain your word in our hearts lord let your spirit your holy spirit open our hearts and our minds to receive this to receive it in the depths of our souls and to be able to retain it, to know that you've got a calling in our lives. Lord, we love you, and we praise you, and we thank you. But Lord, help us to understand what we hear today. Lord, let your spirit speak to us and do a work in us that we cannot do ourselves. And may God receive all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Peter... Uh, says something, and so we're going to pull from that, and, and I'll talk about it as we go. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 9, he says, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Remember that, we fix to come back to it. A holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him, who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The thing that I want you to remember today from this is priesthood. Priesthood. Because when, you, when we read the book of Leviticus, and this was something I didn't know, it is a book of, that it was written to and for the priesthood. So, and you'll understand more about that in a, in a moment, but listen to me. From this verse, from this verse alone, I, I want you to, I, I'm going to get you to repeat some things. Uh, I, want, I want to ask you a question. Who are we? Who are we? We, we listen to the little video, but I want to ask you, who are we? Who are we according to God? And, and here's, what I, I'm going to help you with this, and you're going to repeat after me. I want you to say, I am chosen. That's the word of God. I am part of a royal priesthood. I am a holy gathering of people. And listen to this. I am his own. Amen, amen. And, and here's something else. Why am I all that? You ever, 
You ever ask yourself the question, why am I all of that? So that, and Peter tells us, so that I can proclaim the praises of him who called me out of darkness of sin, out of darkness, not just out of darkness as when you turn out the light. Sin is considered darkness, and he called us out of the darkness of sin and into the marvelous light of Jesus Christ. Uh, man, it, it's, it's wonderful that God's word is so alive to us today and that how that we can read stuff like this. But before we can appreciate Leviticus, we must understand we're part of the New Testament priesthood. Jesus, man, when, when all this stuff was written, and, and you go through it, I, I know some of you already know this, but I, I just, I, I need to tell those that don't know it. Every single book in the Bible, Genesis through Revelation, points to Jesus Christ. Every one of them points to Jesus Christ. And so when we read it, we need to understand that, listen, even when I read in the book of Leviticus, it's pointing to Christ. But it's also, it's also pointing to us. We're part of this priesthood that Moses wrote about thousands of years ago. We're part of that priesthood, and so we have to understand that. We have been called cleansed, consecrated to, pro to proclaim Christ Jesus to the world. And we're going to talk about the called, cleansed, and consecrated here in a few minutes, but I'm, I'm trying to help you to, to understand something here, church. I want us to stop making excuses. God does not call the equipped. He equips the call. The, these people that God is using throughout Old and New Testament, they didn't come to him and say, hey, I am a highly, highly qualified candidate for you to use, okay? You're, you're talking about murderers. You're, you're talking about liars. You're talking about thieves. You, you're talking about, whoo, they would not, when I was, working, you know, in a supervisory uh, position and I came to the applications when we were trying to hire somebody, I had things that I was looking for. I had, I had a criteria that I was looking for in order for me to qualify them as a, as a valid candidate. These people that God used wouldn't have been on my list. They would not have been on my list. But God says, that's the ones I want. So I, I want you to understand, I want you to quit listening to the enemy, quit listening to the, to the enemy of your soul, the devil, telling you how unqualified you are, how uh, you, you just, you've done too much wrong, and you quit listening to all the lies and quit making up excuses and start listening to God and let him define who we are instead of the world, the devil, and the crowd that we've hung, out, hung around with. Amen? Amen? Amen. Like I said, Leviticus is an instructional book to the priesthood. Aaron would go on to become the first high priest of the Old Testament. And I know for some people that doesn't mean a lot, but I'm telling you, in this Old Testament structure of the church, and even in the Orthodox Church today, man, the high priest is, I mean, we get a glimpse of it with, with the Pope. Uh, I think everybody's heard of the Pope. He's the high priest over the, the Catholic Church. And, and you see how that, that they, you know, they adore him and they think he's wonderful and, and he has some tremendous authority and, and all these things. So we kind of get a glimpse of that, but let me tell you something about Aaron, and we're not going to read all of it, okay? I'm just going to, I'm going to give you the cake here, you're going to have to go get the recipe, okay? Uh, he was not perfect. He was not perfect. And he, he had four sons, 
And you know what? They wasn't perfect either, especially two of them. Two of them was a couple of knuckleheads. I, I mean, whew, they just, they didn't think through some of the, the decisions that they were making. Nevertheless, God uses them as examples, good and bad, for future generations. Moses, he is a type of Christ. He is a type of Savior, if you will. But unlike Jesus, who was perfect, Moses, he had his faults too. And, and we can go on and on and on about Moses' faults, about how he made up excuses, how he had a physical, literal speech impediment, and he thought that that was going to disqualify him from speaking publicly. Uh, I, I, I've said this many times before, especially in the growth track class. Uh, I'm an introvert, okay? This is not my natural setting where I'm comfortable at. I, I've been doing this, I don't know, what, goodness, since back there in the mid, well, early 90s, uh, I, I think is when I answered the call to, to, to pastor. Oh, can I tell you something? I still get nervous. I do. Because I see, I get to see this joker every single day. I wake up and look at him in the mirror every day. I, I get to experience me every single day. I can come up with some excuses, just like Moses did. But God's not interested in our excuses. He's interested in our participation, saying yes to him. And so this is a lesson for us that, that God uses imperfect people to carry out his plan of redemption for humanity. If you're saved, you're part of the priesthood, you're part of the church, and can I tell you something? That's plan A. And there is no plan B. That's plan A. You say, well, Brother Ricky, I, I didn't sign up for the priesthood. If you say yes to Jesus, you do. If you say yes to Jesus, and I'm talking about really saying yes, you'll see it before, hopefully before the end of this message. You, when you say yes to him, you say yes to everything. Everything he wants to do in our lives. And can I just give you a pointer? <laughs> Don't be stubborn. Don't be stubborn is not a spiritual gift. I just thought I'd tell you. It is not a spiritual gift. You, you can't say, well, God made me this way, so I'm going to use it. Uh, I, I can tell you some things about stubbornness, but we won't go there right now. It's not a good character trait. Uh, this is what we, uh, this that we are about to read, it is a public ceremony. It is a public ceremony. It is a very important ceremony. It comes with tremendous pomp and circumstance, and that is, man, you're talking about a priestly robe, a priestly garment that they put on. I, I guess the, the closest thing in our, in our culture today that, that I've witnessed, and I think we can all witness here uh, because of the passing of uh, Queen Elizabeth and now the installation of uh, King Charles, look, if you, I don't know if you've seen that, if you've read about it, if you watched it on TV, do you see how important that all of this is? I mean, they are very, very detailed. I, I was reading last night. Man, they've got everything in details as far as what day, what hour, everything is going to transpire. All, everybody's supposed to be in a certain place at a certain time with certain wear that they have on. Man, this is a big deal. I feel a connection to Great Britain. Beverly feels a connection er, to Great Britain, to England because we did our, our lineage, or Ashley did our lineage, and uh, London 
I, I can't remember which one is which, but one of us is from the north side of town, the other one's from the south side of town. And I told Ashley, I said, don't do any more research, and she may be my kinfolk. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know how nasty it is to marry your cousin. Uh, uh, but anyway, so th this is the first time in my life that I have seen a change in the monarchy uh, uh, of England. I, I've never seen, you know, I, I was not even born when Queen Elizabeth came into power. Some, some of you were. But, but this is the first time in my life, and it could be the only time, you know. Who, who knows? I mean, goodness, they've got some lineage going on there. I, I mean, her mother was, all, was uh, over 100, and I think... She was uh, 90, what, 96? Uh, and so Charles, he's still kind of a young guy. So we, we may, I may never see another changing of the guard, if you will. As we read here in Leviticus, I want you to understand, this wasn't some simple little ceremony that nobody seen. This was a big deal. When God was installing a priest, it was a big deal. When God was anointing the priesthood, it was a big deal. When God is calling us to the priesthood, it's a big deal. Don't let the devil tell you that your calling in life, that God's equipping you in your life, is not a big deal. It's a big deal. So let's read in Leviticus. We're going to, we're going to read Leviticus chapter eight verses one through six and then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about it leviticus chapter eight verse number one the lord spoke to moses saying take aaron and his sons with him and the garment the anointing oil the bull as a sin offering two rams and a basket of unleavened bread, and gather all the congregation together at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Now before we move on, the tabernacle, let me explain that. When the children of Israel came out of darkness of Egypt, and they came into the wilderness, life, okay, uh, as they entered over into the promised land, God had instructed them, build a tabernacle. The tabernacle is a temporary thing because once they got into the promised land, then they built a temple which replaced the tabernacle. What, what, is, what is the relationship there? Your body is a tabernacle. Your body is a tabernacle. It is a temporary place that God can dwell if we invite him in. So remember that. So it, the congregation came together at the door of the tabernacle. So Moses did as the Lord commanded him, and the congregation was gathered together at the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and Moses said to the congregation, This is what the Lord commanded to be done. Then Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water. Wash them with water. We're going to talk about three things this morning, three things, and then we'll continue this next week. We're going to talk about the calling, the cleansing, and the consecration, and we'll unpack all this as we go. Uh, first thing we're going to talk about is the calling, the calling. God said, take Aaron and his sons with him and gather the congregation together at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. It is God's calling to us, our families, and those around us to come into the fellowship or into right relationship with God. God is setting them up, but it's not just Aaron, and it's not just his family. It is the whole congregation. How does that relate to us today? Listen, if we have said yes to Jesus Christ, then according to what Peter says, we are 
a holy priesthood. We are representatives that stand between the congregation and God. We are the ones that are supposed to be listening to God for the message to give to the congregation. Your family needs us to listen to God. Everybody's trying to figure out what's wrong with the world today. I tell you what's wrong with the world today. People ain't listening to God and telling their family. I mean, it's, it was in the law. Moses wrote it down that mamas and daddies, grandmas and granddaddies were supposed to know the word of God so much and so well that they raised their children to know God and know God's word. And they, they, he talked about it in, a, in different places. He says, talk about it when you get up. Talk about it when you're walking around town. Talk about it when you lay down. Talk about it to your children. Let everybody know about it. Everybody in the community needs to know what God is saying. Listen, I'm going to tell them, you're going to tell them that God loves them. But I'm also going to tell them if you ain't saved, hey, the wrath of God is abiding on you. Mark it down. I, I'm, listen, I, I praise God for the, uh, the feel-good gospel. But the feel-good gospel needs to be balanced with the wrath of God, too. Hey, the wrath of God is just as true as the love of God. We need to, we, I need to have a balanced diet. Amen? I, I, don't, I know God loves me. But I also know, and, and I don't understand why, but we live in a culture where people don't want to hear bad things. They hear bad things all the time. But if you don't understand, let, let me put it to you like this, mamas and daddies. Does it make you mad when you've raised your children to do right and they do wrong? You're disappointed not to the, you're not going to disown them. And I don't, maybe I'm overreacting a little bit. We got whippings when we were growing up. <laughs> I don't know if they do that anymore. Do it at my house. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> God gets angry when we do wrong. And that's not something you hear talked about a whole lot. But that's something that as the priesthood, we are responsible for telling people, yes, God loves you. God wants you to do the right thing, not just what you won't think. God has got a priesthood. If you've said yes to Jesus, you're in it. But he wants us to answer the calling. Moses had a calling on his life before he met God at the age of 80 at the burning bush. That's right. He was 80 years old when he was on the backside of that desert tending the flock, minding his own business, and all of a sudden, <clears throat> God entered the scene through a burning bush. But Moses, what Moses maybe didn't realize at the time, he came to realize it later, that God was working on his mama and daddy, getting them in position. He was working on grandma, granddaddy. He, God was working before Moses was ever even born. You see, Jeremiah tells us this. He says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before I formed you, God says, in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I set you apart. I ordained. I had a place for you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Now, he's talking to Jeremiah but listen, one of the doctrines that we need to understand in the Bible, as I said, God is immutable. He does not change, okay? Something else we need to understand. God is no respecter of persons. God doesn't, God's not going to love you and not love you. He, he, he's not going to have a purpose and a plan for your life and not have a purpose and a plan for somebody else's life. 
If God spoke this to Jeremiah, he can also speak the same thing to Moses. He can also speak the same thing to us. Before I formed you, I knew you. What do you mean you knew me? God says, before I knit you together in your mother's womb, I already knew you. I had your personality. I gave you your personality, not your stubbornness. I gave you your personality. I gave you the gift. I gave you everything that you needed in order to do life. He says, and I set you apart for my purpose. My purpose. You want to know why you're living? It's not to satisfy our own carnal desires. We are, we are living for God's plan and purpose in our lives. He said, I ordained you. God said, I got a place for you. You know God's got a place for every man, woman, boy, and girl. He's got a place in life. And so many times we got people wandering around through life. Some of them, I wasn't one of them, uh, but, but some people, and I got them in my family, they've tried to make a career out of college. I'm talking about a lifetime career. You know, two years, four years, six years. If it gets into the eighth year, quit sandbagging. All right? It's, it's time to get out from under mom and daddy's roof. All right? Find you something to do. They're trying to figure out what their purpose in life is. God says, if you'll just seek me, I got a purpose for you. I got a plan for you. I'll show you what you're supposed to do. Now, Moses is, he's well over 100 years old at the writing of Leviticus. He, God has used him to deliver over a million people out of bondage in Egypt. But God is also preparing, he didn't just prepare Moses, now he's preparing Aaron and his sons to assist Moses in, in calling and ministering to others. But also God is preparing a people, listen to me, a people to carry on when Moses passes away. <clears throat> Too many times, and I know I've, even at the uh, age of 58 now, I've already begun to look at retirement. But let me tell you something about retirement. It, it, that is not in our, our Bible. Okay, You can retire from your job but you can't retire from God's call, okay? And, and I've seen it happen in this church and in other churches. Well, Brother Ricky, I'm too old. We need to let some of them younger folks do it, and I agree. But I also agree that there needs to be a balance. Us old folk, don't need to get upset when the young folk, when they want to do something. Young folks, we don't need to disrespect our elders. But I just don't like the way they're doing it. They won't let me do it the way I want to. Patience. Moses was 80 before God started using him. And for the next 40 years, God used him. So unless you're above the age of 120, I don't want to hear about it, okay? <laughs> God is preparing a people to take over when Moses passes on. Can I tell you something, church? The calling doesn't die. The calling doesn't die. It's passed on to the next generation. And I told somebody one day, it's been months and months and months ago, I told somebody that, listen, unless Jesus comes, and I'm ready for that, but unless Jesus comes, I'm just laying, I'm trying to lay a foundation for the next generation to come in. 
I want them to come in. And I'm excited. Not Listen, it's not that I want to, to sit back and do nothing. Man, I, I love it when I see the younger generation getting involved, doing things, doing the things. I, I don't know if y'all have noticed it. To those of you that remember me when I first came here back in 2000 and, what was it, 2002, I wasn't this swole up. And my body didn't hurt the way it hurts now. It makes me feel good when, when some of these younger folks can get in here and, and do some of these things. I'm not against them. I'm cheering them, cheering them on. Come on. Come on. So, listen, there ain't no competition. There's cooperation. There's cooperation. The calling doesn't die. It's passed on from one generation to another. So now let's look at Leviticus chapter 8, verse number 6. We're going to talk about the cleansing. Then Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water. He washed them with water. Mm. Before they can put on the priestly garments. A cleansing is necessary. A cleansing is necessary. You remember in John chapter uh, 13 when Jesus, uh, you know, it's the last supper and after the supper's over with, you know, he took the towel and he, he, he wrapped it around himself and he told his, his disciples, uh, he said, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wash your feet. Uh, Remember when he got to Peter, he said, you know, I'm, I'm going to wash your feet. And old Peter said, nope, <laughs> you ain't washing my feet. Uh, and Jesus said, if I don't wash you, you ain't got no part with me, brother. In other words, if you don't allow me, Jesus, to do what I want to do in your life, he says, there ain't nothing I can do for you. You're not, you're not going to have any part. In my kingdom. And old Peter changed his mind. He said, Lord, don't just wash my feet. Wash my head and my hands too. Here I am. In other words, Peter surrendered. You see that stubbornness. I, why do I keep saying, is anybody battling with stubbornness? I don't know why. That wasn't in my notes, but it keeps coming up. But old Peter, he said, Okay, he said, I'm, I said no before, but now that you put it that way, here I am. And I think we need to be more like Peter. We need to understand, here I am, Lord. Jesus, if you want to wash me, wash me. If you want to cleanse me, cleanse me. And you know the Bible teaches us that he does. And Jesus says, when I wash you, he says, you are completely clean. Jesus says, when I do it, you're clean. You don't have to help me. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> I have these thoughts go through my mind, just so you'll know, and I have to weigh them. Do I need to say that or not? And that one's like, no, I don't need to say that one. Move on. Before they can stand before the congregation as priests, listen to me, the congregation needs to see evidence that they are clean. Like I said, this is a public thing. This is not happening in private. Moses took Aaron and his sons and stood them before the congregation and he washed them. Why? Because the congregation needed to see evidence that they're not just dressing up to look good. They've gone through the process. And they've gone through the washing. Can I tell you something, church? The people around us need to see that we're going through the process. That we're different. I, I've heard it said, there's, there's 
There's more of the world in the church than there is the church in the world. Let me back up and say that again. Sometimes the people in the church are trying to be too much like the world. We, we need to quit being trying to be like the world, and we need to be the priest that we've been called to be, representatives of the Almighty God. We need to let the world know that we've been washed. We've been washed. Washed in his word, washed in, by his spirit, washed in the blood. We used to sing songs. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. They need to see the grace of God demonstrated in our lives, the mercy demonstrated in our lives, the boundaries demonstrated in our lives, dem uh, uh, devotion demonstrated in our lives. That, that's what the world needs to see, that the priesthood, that we as priests of God, it's serious business. Notice Aaron and his sons did not bathe themselves. Moses bathed them. He washed them. They didn't wash themselves. Church, we cannot make ourselves clean. We cannot. We must allow Jesus Christ to wash us and to cleanse us. Aaron and his sons had to submit to someone who was higher in power and authority than they were. We too must submit ourselves to someone who is higher in power and authority than we are, and his name is Jesus. When we do that, he'll take care. He knows how to wash us. As a matter of fact, he tells us, John tells us, he said, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What is the only responsibility that we have in that scripture? Confessing our sins. I come to before him, Lord, here I am. I messed up. I sinned. You, you call it messed up, you call it tripped up, you call it whatever you want to call it, but I'm telling you, church, when we come before him, the thing that we need to realize is confession makes a difference. It opens the door for him to cleanse me and forgive me. And he is faithful and he will do it if we will just do our part. Amen? The third thing that we're going to talk about is the consecration. The consecration. What does that word consecration mean? Dedication installation, ordination, commitment, or devote or devotion. Uh, to give you an example that we've seen here, uh, we've had baby dedications here, okay? That is a committing something or a consecrated a child to God. In other words, we're putting it in God's hands, putting that child in God's hands, putting that, that child in God's hands, and we are here to you know, do our part to nurture that child in the, in the nurture and the admonition of Jesus Christ, the knowledge of Christ. Some of you remember uh, when I came on here as associate pastor, we had an installation service or an ordination service here, uh, and Pastor Mark you know, I was kneeling here at the altar. I'll never forget it. And I didn't expect it. I didn't know this was going to happen. But he took off his suit coat and he draped it around me. And, and I'm telling you, folks, that meant something to me. Because I, I saw that kind of like the uh, Elijah passing on to Elisha, the cloak. You know, I, I'm telling you, church, don't, don't take the consecration of our lives lightly don't don't take it lightly it says after moses had washed them he dressed them in their priestly garments then comes the anointing and consecration it says also moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was in it and consecrated them now we're not just talking about the guy the priest Every element, every element 
of that consecration was important. The anointing oil was to be an outward indication of an inward consecration. Outward indicators are important. Listen, the way we act, people see that. That's an outward. The, the way we talk, that is an outward. And, and we'll get to this later, but what we listen to in the presence of other people, that's an outward. That is, that is something that is evident to the people around us. There is an outward manifestation of, of an inward transformation. You know, now they were going, yes, the Holy Spirit was in the Old Testament, but not like the New Testament church. Man, God said He poured out His Spirit upon, you know, all flesh. In other words, you don't have to be Jewish to get it. He says, all the elements of their lives and ministries were to be anointed. All the elements of our lives and ministries are to be anointed, consecrated, devoted to the Almighty. It's not just showing up on Sunday. Man, it's every single day. You and I, we are a part of the priesthood. When I go back to my family, when I go to my job, when I go to school, wherever I'm at, I'm still part of the priesthood. This is not just a Sunday morning thing. We're part of a royal priesthood that God is using, and he wants our lives, every element of it. Moses walked through that tabernacle, and there was, a, there was the, the altar where, where the washing took place. He, he anointed that. He consecrated that. There were all the, the candlesticks and the, the fire brands and all these things that he was using. Anointed, 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 consecrated, consecrated, everything, everything. Listen, everything, my thoughts are to be consecrated to God. My actions are to be consecrated to God. Everywhere I go is to be a consecration to God. I don't, I don't go to the juke joints anymore. Hallelujah. Why? Because it would be an outward manifestation of, that something is wrong to the congregation. They know. The world knows how we ought to behave. They can tell us. All the elements of our lives is an outward demonstration of an inward transformation. Paul tells us, and we'll close with this. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body, my body, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. He says, I'm pleading with you. And that, that word reasonable there is where we get our word logical from it's the greek word logical it is the most logical thing that we can do to give our bodies to god why because the bible says you've been bought with a price you're not your own i've been bought you've been bought god gave his son jesus gave his life spilled out his blood on the cross for our sin Paul says, the most logical thing I can do is just say, here I am. Here I am. And regardless of what you have heard from the enemy, regardless of what you hear from your accusers around you, God's word says, you're a living sacrifice. You're a living sacrifice. In other words, I've been laid on the altar. I belong to God. I've been consecrated to God. And I'm holy. You're holy. Not because of what we have done, but because of Jesus Christ and what he has done. God is calling. God is cleansing. And God is consecrating. 
even now. This is an ongoing thing, church. This is an ongoing thing. So let us understand this. We'll get into part two, Lord willing. Now, if Jesus comes, it's canceled, okay? But if we get to meet next week, I'm still going to be excited about the book of Leviticus, okay? Because we ain't got to the big toe yet. I want you to know about the big toe and the thumb and the right ear lobe. But folks, if you didn't know that you were a priest, you wouldn't appreciate anything about those other elements. Because it does matter. It really does. So, let me do this. I want us to, every head bowed and every eye closed. and uh, We can just find some music to play softly. Nobody looking around. What has the enemy told you? What's he whispered in your ear? Has he told you that this stuff doesn't matter to you? Your life doesn't matter. Your calling doesn't matter. Your gifts don't matter. You can't make a difference. Has he told you that junk? Can I tell you something? He's a liar. He's a liar. God took imperfect people and brought about the plan of salvation. And God is using today in this church age in 2022 God is using imperfect people to carry out his plan. God is calling you God is cleansing you. God is consecrating you. He is devoting you and asking us to devote ourselves, to surrender ourselves to the calling that he's got for our life. And there is but one correct answer, and that is yes. If we answer no, then as Jesus told Peter, you'll have no part with me. But Lord, help us today. I hope that every man, woman, boy, and girl who's hearing this message today will say yes to the calling. Say yes to the cleansing. Say yes to the consecration the dedication of our lives to the rest of our lives, the rest of our days here on this earth to do what you've called us to do. Lord, thank you for calling us to be a part of this priesthood that is alive and well today and working to get people in to the kingdom of God. Or if there's anyone here that does not know you as Lord and Savior, as King, as Redeemer, Lord, I pray that today would be their day. Lord Jesus, that, that door of the tabernacle is the door of our heart. And Lord, you, you knock on that door. You, you don't kick the door in. You don't barge in. You don't force your way in. Lord, you, you knock, and we have to say yes. Come on in. So, Lord, today, if someone is saying yes to you, help them, Lord, and come on in. Come on in. Lord, you see it. As your word says, you knew us before you ever formed us in the womb. And how much more do you know us today that we've lived these, these years on this earth? God, you know us very well. You know us better than we know ourselves. Lord, forgive us of our sins. We confess them now to you. 
We ask you to cleanse us, to forgive us, to wash us in the blood, in the spirit, and in your word. God, make us what we need to be. Help us to surrender to the power of your Holy Spirit and say yes in every area, every area of our lives, whatever it may be. Lord, we open everything up to you and we surrender it to you in Jesus' name. Father, I pray for this congregation. I pray for these people. I pray for this priesthood, the priest that you have called. We have a high priest. He is Jesus Christ, the righteous one. But we are also part of that priesthood. We are the children. Lord, thank you for allowing us to be part of this priesthood. Help us to hear from you. Help us to be sensitive to what you're wanting to do, to use us for the ministries that, that you've called us to be a part of, to lead, to, to empower, to, to just help. Lord, whatever it is that you've called us to, help us to consecrate ourselves to that, to devote ourselves to it. Lord, all the body works together, together, to fulfill the purpose of God. Lord, we thank you for it. And we give you the praise, honor, and glory. So now, Lord, as we leave this place, go with us in the power of your Holy Spirit to direct our steps, to help us, Lord, to do everything that you've called us to do, everything you've enabled us to do. Lord, help us to walk in forgiveness and grace and love and mercy. Not only receiving it for ourselves, but also sharing it with others. Help the world around us to see, the congregation around us to see that we have devoted ourselves to Christ and we are different and we thank God for it and we make no apologies for it. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you. In the marvelous name of Jesus Christ we pray. And everyone said amen and amen. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. Amen. Oh, uh, I love you, Pine Grove. I know, man, this is this is deep stuff. But I remember teaching uh, Ashley as she was growing up uh, simple things like cutting a steak. She didn't appreciate it when she was growing up, but she appreciated it once she reached, once she reached adulthood and had to go to a, a, a steakhouse and mom and daddy wasn't there to cut, cut up her steak for her. Sometimes like this, we need to take off the bib and get out the steak knife and, and let God teach us how to eat meat. Okay, This thing is milk and it's bread but it's also meat. You had meat today, okay? Just thank God for the meat. You say, brother, I'm going to have to chew on it a while. That's okay. Chew on it. Ask questions, okay? But we're going to continue this next week, Lord willing. God bless you. Go in peace. If you have tithes and offerings, the ushers are waiting outside. Love you. Appreciate you. God bless you. Bye-bye.